determinar o tempo em que estes incríveis animais viveram sobre a Terra é uma tarefa muito complexa. Afinal, novamente nos enfrentamos com fragmentos de um passado muito distante. Mas devemos manter viva a curiosidade, porque qualquer descoberta, por menor que pareça, abrirá novas janelas para explorar o passado, o presente e o futuro do nosso planeta. interesting things is that in the what we consider the upper part of the Cretaceous rocks um, the dinosaurs we find there are almost always in what is called a fluvial deposit and that's supposed to be like a river made it um, and there's a, an absurdly high amount of these when you get in those rocks um, lower than that you might find some but they're not as common and not as prolific and so um, a lot of these bone beds they find up there and these rocks are um, look like they're in processes like river type processes, um, but they're huge, enormous um, expanses of these things in Canada and in the United States and in Russia. And um, so the question is, you know, what is making this? Uh, why is this happening? And, you know, one possibility as we're thinking about um, creation geology and paleontology would be that this would be possibly a runoff um, very late in the flood. And so you might be seeing that as floodwaters are draining, they're going to create channels like a river, um, and it's going to move like a river. And so carcasses that are still floating around or are um, recently deposited are going to be uh, maybe reworked or just transported into these different channels and buried at different spots. And um, so yeah, what you see is just, um, sometimes you'll find complete skeletons in, in some places um, where you just get exceptional preservation. Um, other places, like in Wyoming, usually what they're finding are isolated bones here and there. And some places are even worse. The place I studied was, you know, broken bones here and there and there. So um, sometimes you wouldn't be able to recognize what you're picking up other than you can say it's a bone. And uh, that is uh, something that can happen in, in the record. And so you want to just understand, you know, all the different processes involved in getting, starting with a complete dinosaur and ending up with however many kinds of bones you get. Ou seja, a taphonomia estuda a causa da morte, se foi por uma tragédia, se foi por doenças. Você consegue investigar isso? de acordo com os fósseis, o que, que teria provocado a morte daqueles animais? O, como foi a decomposição? Ela foi por micro-organismos? Ela foi por animais carniceiros? Ela foi rápida? Ela demorou? No caso dos vertebrados, como é que foi a desarticulação dos ossos? Desarticularam ao mesmo tempo? Desarticulou uma parte e a outra continuou? Depois da desarticulação, como é que foi o transporte? Ele foi intenso? Ele foi mais rápido? Quando nós examinamos os ossos, é possível identificar se o transporte foi é, curto ou se foi um transporte mais longo. Eles vão estar quebrados, fragmentados, moídos, à medida que as correntes vão transportando. Portanto, dá para separar ossos muito preservados, pouco transportados, de ossos é, muito mal preservados, quebrados, fragmentados, que foram transportar, transportados por mais tempo. E depois, a outra fase seria a deposição em algum local. Como é que foi essa deposição? Foi rápida? foi lenta, neste caso as rochas que vão estar envolvendo os fósseis vai nos dizer como é que foi essa deposição e por fim como é que se deu a fossilização, ou seja a passagem do sedimento macio mole para uma rocha dura, essa passagem implica em aumento da pressão aumento da temperatura a circulação é, de fluido nos poros e a expulsão de boa parte da água, fazendo com que aquele sedimento inicialmente macio se torne numa rocha bastante dura Todo esse processo, enfim, nós chamamos de o campo de estudo da tafonomia. Quando estudamos as condições necessárias para a excelente preservação dos fósseis, como aqui apreciamos em lugares como esta escavação paleontológica, aqui no estado de Wyoming, no oeste dos Estados Unidos, 
descobrimos que do ponto de vista de um fóssil, um soterramento rápido é o caminho mais curto para sua preservação. É interessante observar que as características sedimentárias das camadas em que os ossos foram encontrados indicam um tipo especial de escoamento da água, no qual a turbulência é suprimida, fazendo com que tanto a água quanto os sedimentos se movam juntos de uma forma bastante plástica. Este tipo de escoamento em massa é conhecido como escoamento torrencial de lama e não é incomum nos dias de hoje. The goal that we have here for this project is is to understand what happened to the dinosaurs. Is it uh, what were they doing when they when they were killed? What were what was it that killed them? And then what happened after they died? This is this is what we call taphonomy, and taphonomy is the science of reconstructing the history of death of of organisms. And by learning this, we can try to figure out more about the history of the world. So as we excavate these bones, we try to keep all the information that we get from the bone, its position in, in space and the kinds of sediment it's buried in and what bone it is. Uh, all this information we try to keep together so that we can try to figure out what the history of these animals was. And of course, our, our goal in that is to, to just be able to put together a history of the earth that makes sense. So paleontologists, whether they're secular paleontologists or, or paleontologists that have a view of, of the world as a, a created place, in either case, we, we have the same goal of trying to put together a picture of the Earth that makes sense. The main studies that we're doing are twofold. One, they're taxonomic. What are we finding at Handsome Ranch? And then we're asking a question, how did it get there? The science of classification is called taxonomy, how you name things. The science of how things get transported and buried is called taphonomy, with a PH instead of an X. Taphonomy, um, we try and look at all of the evidence there and try and come up with an understanding of how it got there. For instance, at um, most of the quarries at at Hanson Research Station, all of the dinosaur bones are disarticulated. <clears throat> that means you don't find the leg bone connected to the hip bone, connect, like you sing your song, <clears throat> you find the isolated bone. You find the, uh, the femur, or the forearm, the tibia or fibula. Um, okay, so you have an animal that weighs four or five tons. Um, how long does it take for it to rot? Um, how much time did we have for the flood? Where were these things rotten? Because they weren't rotting where they are. They've been transported from somewhere else to where they are after they had rotted. But there may have been still tissue on them based on uh, the chemistry of some clays around the fossils, these orange clays that um, changed probably because of acid-base chemistry between the clay particles. So somehow they had a place where they rotted, came apart, were transported without leaving any marks there. At one place, when we first started, second year maybe, uh, we found a, a humerus in the soil at, a, at about a 45 degree angle going down through. Well, not the humus, a radius. The radius is a very narrow, thin bone. There's no way it's sitting in the dirt for even one year or two years, let alone millions of years at a 45 degree angle and not break and come apart, whatever. This was deposited as one single catastrophic event that doesn't mean it was Noah's flood, but it means it was consistent with an interpretation of Noah's flood. It was a catastrophic transport bed. I 
ampla distribuição geográfica dos fósseis e os fascinantes processos que compreendem sua formação e sua configuração organizada nas camadas da coluna geológica constituem peças fundamentais na tentativa da ciência de decifrar o que aconteceu no planeta Terra. Embora nem todos os fósseis pertençam a restos orgânicos de organismos extintos, o registro em sua maioria abrange espécies que hoje já não vivem sobre a superfície terrestre. Uma grande quantidade de animais e vegetais que testemunham de um passado em que a natureza era muito mais abundante e diversa. Fósseis que nos contam a história de um mundo submergido em uma catástrofe sem precedentes. The most obvious thing we can know about dinosaurs would just be, you know, their bones. What are they? What are the general outline of the animal? Um, so that's typically what you think of when you're finding a fossil. You think, oh, I'm finding a, a bone, part of a skeleton. Um, but what's really amazing about fossils is how much we can learn about them. So. Um, some of these um, will actually have impressions of skin on them, and so we can know a little bit what the skin of an animal, like a dinosaur, would look like. Um, sometimes we will get um, other kinds of um, integument, like maybe they had um, little crests on their heads, or maybe they had um, different kinds of fibers or feathers on them. Um, we also find um, sometimes stomach contents, so sometimes you'll see the last meal this dinosaur had before it died. Um, and then kind of outside of the skeleton, you would find things like Uh, sometimes we'll find uh, fossilized dung, which we call a coprolite. Sometimes you find uh, footprints of these animals. Sometimes you find evidence of them attacking or eating each other um, and tooth marks. We also find evidence of disease. Uh, sometimes they'll find evidence of arthritis or cancer in a dinosaur. And what's really fascinating recently is that they will sometimes find um, pigment cells. And so uh, we are able to sometimes determine some of the colors that these animals might have been, which is Uh, really kind of blows your mind that we can figure that out from a fossil. And the most interesting thing, I think, from a creationist perspective is that they've been able to find um, red blood cells and other kinds of tissue, preserved proteins like collagen um, that are supposedly lasting for 65 or more million years. And uh, we, of course, would say we think that's not possible that they could last that long. Um, but even from a creationist perspective, it's difficult to imagine how these things might survive in these rocks for a few thousand years. So. Uh, there's a lot of work there to be done, but it's just incredible how much we can really learn about these animals. O conhecimento paleontológico atual sobre os dinossauros combina a observação de diversos registros fósseis, ósseos e não ósseos, com vários campos de estudo que contribuem em sua interpretação. O apoio de ciências como a geologia Biologia, química e física provaram ser essenciais para compreender mais detalhes sobre a vida destes seres do passado. Suas características físicas, seu comportamento e inclusive o tipo de meio ambiente em que eles habitavam. The dinosaurs don't just exist in the sediments by themselves. They live in a environment In the, in the rocks, that is, the, the fossils are associated with other fossils as well. So we find the bones of mammals, certain kinds of mammals, way down at the very beginning of the dinosaurs, there were already mammals. And this, this year, for example, we found a beautiful jaw of a mammal, which we still haven't uh, been able to identify. And we find residues of plants, we find remains of many, many plants, we find coal, we find amber, which is made up of the sap of, petrified sap of, uh, of plants. We find pine cones, we find seeds, lots of seeds of plants. And then we find other ma animals as well. We find turtle bones and turtles and crocodiles and frogs and lizards and all different kinds of uh, animals associated with these remains. So it's as if a whole ecosystem was buried in along with the dinosaurs, not just the dinosaurs themselves. You do find evidence of ancient ecosystems in Mesozoic rocks. You find carnivorous dinosaurs, herbivorous dinosaurs, omnivorous ones, and you find different levels of it. Um, 
you can see uh, the plants that they had. If you're in the Triassic you'll, and Jurassic, you'll find a lot of what we call gymnosperms, um, plants like conifers, ginkgos, um, cycads, uh, some extinct plants called cycadioids. And uh, once you get into Cretaceous rocks, you start finding angiosperms, which are flowering plants. So you'll find fruit, you'll find flowers, uh, all kinds of things like that. And you see buried with those animals that look like they're eating these things. So uh, you'll find our first bumblebees and things like that there as well. But um, there are some pterosaurs, some flying reptiles called um, tapajarids, and they are suspected to be frugivorous. They're eating fruit. Um, we also uh, see evidence of um, animals eating each other. Um, we find uh, Dinosaurs, small dinosaurs like Compsognathus with lizards in their stomachs. Um, Coelophysis looks like it ate some kind of a crocodile type animal. Um, you also find dinosaurs that have eaten other dinosaurs. So uh, an example would be um, there's some Tyrannosaur uh, remains that they found um, acid etched duckbill dinosaur bones around their stomach area, you know, so this thing was eating that. Um, you find uh, some pterosaurs and some dinosaurs that look like they were specialized for eating fish. Um, so there's a dinosaur called Baryonyx, which is a spinosaur from England, and there were fish scales found around it, um, and it has a crocodile-looking snout. Uh, there are pterosaurs that there are um, fish remains found in their stomach or in coprolites around their body. Um, so we get a really good idea of what interactions are like. Uh, my favorite example, unfortunately it's not in the Mesozoic, it's in the Paleozoic. Um, there has been, they found a shark that had eaten two amphibians, and inside of one of the amphibians is a fish. So you actually have like a three-step, you know, food chain right there that's preserved in, in a uh, fossil, which is pretty crazy. Um, but we do get those, those interactions, and that can help us to understand the way the world was working um, before and during the flood, and, and maybe even after in some cases. O campo da pesquisa de dinossauros experimentou um crescimento exponencial a partir de 1970, quando a paleontologia dos vertebrados se converteu em um campo da ciência global. As escavações em novas regiões até o momento inexploradas, incluindo Índia, América do Sul, Madagascar, Antártica e a mais formidável, China, resultaram no descobrimento de extraordinários fósseis de dinossauros, nunca antes vistos ou estudados. Novas descobertas que revolucionaram a paleontologia moderna e a levou, inclusive, a repensar algumas interpretações até o momento consideradas absolutas. Tanto sobre os dinossauros como sobre as condições do mundo em que estes habitavam. For the dinosaurs to be alive, the environment had to be very productive. Um, there had to be lots of biomass to support creatures as large as dinosaurs. Um, in today's environment, there would not be enough resources in the, ter in the terms of food to support such large creatures. So it's probably a high highly productive environment, warm, humid temperatures, lots of vegetation. A lot of what we know about the environment of that time comes from fossilized plants. Um, you do find plants in the fossil record. So using what we find in the fossil record, what type of plants we find, we can compare those plants to the plants we have today. And you know, plants have specific environmental requirements. So we look at the plants today, their environmental requirements, we look at the plants that we find in the fossil record, and we can make a pretty good guess on what the environment looked like during the time of the dinosaurs. How do we know what kind of ecosystem they lived in? I say they lived in a warmer climate, but how do I know that? And how can we ever know? It's interesting if you believe that all the animals we have today along with man lived on the earth at the same time as the dinosaurs, and I, I believe that's true, then the earth must have been partitioned into different environments. And there must have been some environments that were more favorable to dinosaurs and some that were more favorable to mammals because we only find a few mammals along with the dinosaurs. Interestingly, the mammals we do find are very small and probably highly active like modern shrews. And we know from the behavior of shrews today that they have a very high metabolic rate. 
And so perhaps these animals lived also in that warmer climate where they didn't have to exert so much energy to, to stay warm. One of the controversies we have with dinosaurs is whether they were cold-blooded or warm-blooded and how would we know which one they were? Well, we know that all reptiles, or most rept almost all reptiles today, are cold-blooded. That means that they assume the body temperature of their environment. And thus, in the morning, they move slowly, and then as they warm up, they become more active. And dinosaurs could have been this way because all the other reptiles are, and they are reptiles. On the other hand, there are some people that think this big an animal, it must have it must have been warm-blooded because it would have to maintain its body temperature because when you weigh 60 tons, if at night you cool down, the daytime may never get you back warm again. So it's thought by some people that they must have been warm-blooded. Another alternative and one that I favor is that the dinosaurs lived in a warmer climate, not in the cooler climate where the mammals and, and humans lived, but in a warmer climate where the temperature remained pretty warm even at night, so they didn't have to go through that cooling down. So this, this is a, a subject of a lot of controversy. Os estudos tafonômicos nos permitem analisar a história da fossilização de uma associação fóssil, ou seja, os fósseis e os sedimentos em que eles foram enterrados. Quando em um mesmo extrato se distinguem grupos de fósseis que compartilham alguns fatores, é possível estabelecer famílias tafonômicas, agrupando os restos dos que, se acredita, compartilharam uma história em comum. Mas para restaurar os fragmentos desse complexo passado e reconstruir aquilo que aconteceu com estes seres, será necessário um estudo ainda mais. If we look at the, the kinds of uh, other animals and the plants found with the dinosaurs, we can learn something about their environment, but we have to remember we're not seeing them in their normal environments. We're seeing them in a place where they got brought in by water and dumped in a lot with a lot of other things. Um, and so it may or may not represent the normal environment they lived in, but it tells us something about plants and animals that, that were being brought in with those dinosaurs and probably came from sort of the same environment. Although we find the dinosaurs associated with an ecosystem, probably one that they, similar to the one they lived in, it was not present where they are now buried. The dinosaurs cannot have lived where they're buried now because they are uh, being deposited by a catastrophic flood and underneath them are thousands of feet, thousands of meters of other sediments uh, that were also buried during that flood. So it's very clear to us that the dinosaurs were transported up onto this, these layers and where they were buried along with their environment. So the animals and their environment were swept up and transported together out on top of these layers that were already deposited. Ao observar o registro fóssil, reconhecemos vestígios de grandes extinções em massa, sinais de sepultamentos praticamente espontâneos que retratam com uma fotografia o um momento em que para estes seres tudo findou. Evidências de um mundo em comoção moldado por grandes quantidades de água e sedimentos que sepultaram em sua profundidade silenciosos testemunhos do que aconteceu. Será que ao estudá-los a fundo, poderemos finalmente ser capazes de ouvir a história que eles têm para contar? People ask me how old the dinosaurs are. Now, what we we do know that the kinds of dinosaurs we're finding were the dinosaurs that were as high in the geological column as dinosaurs are found. So this is just before they all disappeared as things were laid down. So they asked me how old they are. So my, really I respond and say, how old would you like them to be? And there's two answers that I think, two answers. One is 65 million years. And if you ask a paleontologist 
secular paleontologists, and they'd say, yes, these are in the upper Cretaceous, just before the KT boundary, and that was about 65 million years ago. That's the conventional dating. If you ask a creationist, they would say, oh, more like 4,500, 5,000, some small number. And these were most likely, from our perspective, killed in the flood, Noah's flood, and were buried. Both of these models, one's quite different than the other, one is biblically based in the sense that we use that information that's provided in the Bible as looking at a way of explaining the evidence. In none of this have we gone in and said we're trying to prove the Bible. That's not the thing. We're trying to find out information about it, about these dinosaurs and how they were laid down. We want this, first of all, to be scientifically credible. So we do not state that we have proven Noah's flood or anything of that sort. You can't say that at all. But we can say that the evidence appears that we had a large herd of animals. You think of the bison in North America that just covered the plains. So we had a large herd of these animals that were killed. We don't know how. The killed and probably were scavenged and the flesh rotted away. And then something washed them into this layer and deposited them there. A larger area than you would think of as a bend in the river or a lake bottom or something of this sort that would accumulate. So that's a model that everybody can sort of say, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And if you want to think of Noah's flood, that's okay. If you want to think of the asteroid hitting the um, Yucatan Peninsula and putting a wall of water around the, uh, the world and washing them all in, that's okay too. But we're not trying to distinguish those kinds of differences. We're really trying to let the bones tell us and teach us what we can understand from their distribution, what, you know, what's this message they're trying to tell us.